All right. So, so what are we going to do? To put this in verse gear now. Now, now let's say you said the engine is on this end, right? Yeah. One of the things that gets me really distressed is when I sit down with people at the end of the term, and I have a piece laying here, and I got you know part of the hands-on final, and I'll say, tell me which end the engine's on, and they'll be pointing over here and all this. The drive shaft goes here. If you've ever pulled one out, you know that's where the drive shaft goes, right? Okay, this one here is in neutral, so you were, you had your act together a while ago. What do you think? I'm going to put it in first. Come here and show me. Yeah. Show me what I'm going to do to put it in first. Show me what I need to do to put it in first. you got to move the gears back. Which one? The last one. You mean this one? Don't move it, just show me which one I need to move. This one won't move. Yeah. You can't move that gear. It's going to stay right where it's at. Which one's can't move? The ones that the shifter is attached to, which is these. These are synchronizers. Right? Okay. I need to move, move it back towards the Okay, you just put it in third gear. Yeah. So you move forward? <laughs> That's fourth gear. If you move this one forward, it's fourth because that locks both these shafts together and it gives you your straight through. All right, if you move this one back, that makes this gear the one that's carrying the load. So what happens, see, anytime the engine running, the cluster gear is spinning, right? Okay, even though it's freewheeling every gear on here, nothing's going on anywhere. The freewheeling gear is on the bottom back here in fifth, right? See if I can turn it. See that one back here? Okay, so if I'm going to move this back here, you notice there's a little brass blocker ring. And that brass blocker ring has got a sort of a tapered inside and surface. And what that's, or either that'll have a lining on it. And it's going to cut through that uh, oil that's in here. And that oil is going to force this to come to the same speed as that and go in there without grinding. And then this gear right here, which is the big, heavy, strong gear, it's got more strength to it than any other gear. It's helical cut, but it's a heavy, strong gear because it's first gear. And it's basically going to, right on the very end of this cluster gear down here, which is the one piece, is that gear that this is interacting with. So you got the power flow going down, all the way back, up here, and out the back. All right now, if I put it in first gear, one of the reasons that I don't typically do that is because you got to do it with a hammer because this thing's been fooled with. But I mean, if I take it, I can usually bump it like that. There you go. That's first right there. See that? Now getting it back out of there is kind of aggravating because it's, uh, I don't give, give me that soft hammer we got in there. I, I need to bump this through it in and out of its gears. Where? You know where they are? They're in the tool room? The brass one? Yeah. That will do. The brass one will do. But anyway, if I can get that to move back. I should have brought a hammer with me. Anyway, now what I'm going to do to put it in second gear. Because right now I'm in first gear. I'm in first gear and I'm turning that way. The engine turns that way. Right? And see how, if you look at this, if you look at our marks that I put on here, this one here is on top. All right, and this one here has got to make one, two, three. It's going to make like three and a half turns before that one ever comes around once. So what is that? That's like a three and a half to one, right? All right, if I had a three and a half to one in my uh, rear differential, let's say it was, you know, there's not going to be this even, what it, what it was three to one. So if my differential was three to one and this was three and a half to one, what would the ratio be from the engine to the wheels? How would you get that? You know? Yeah, I mean, the actual wheel is driving the car. We've lost our brass hammer. We got any word is? That's annoying to get that back out of there because it's got to go past the There it is. Alright, you see there? Alright, now then, if I move that forward, that's second gear. All right, now let's see what that ratio is. All right, we got that one on top. Let's make a new mark right here on this one here. Does that like have that. a transfer case bolted onto it? Mm, yeah, except it had a, you know, there was a 
another piece of aluminum back here. All right, so this is up and that's up. Let's see what this ratio is. I'm going all the way around. I've passed it once. I've passed it twice. Okay, when that one comes up, that's like two and a half to one, right? So that's your second gear. See, you were three and a half, now two and a half, you know how you're going up through your gears and all that? There we go. We're back in neutral again. Now, whenever we move this thing into third, like, like that, see, let's see what that one is. Kathy was a waitress in a small cafe. All right. I'm going to put a three on there so we'll know where it's at. So if we're going to turn this through, we're going to turn that all the way through. We're at that is going this one here, one and a half to one. One and a half rounds here, that's third. And then finally, when we go to the fourth, now these are all together. Now I didn't get it all the way in fourth because it'll be, anyway, it's good enough to see. See that? Now then, everything's turning like it's all one shaft. Make sense? Now you see this little synchronizer moves around freely in there and it's got some little bit of back and forth so it can actually line it up. They were downshifted one and I heard it go you can hear it inside the transmission. It's forcing that other gear to pick up speed and match where it's at. Okay, so, so now that we've gone through all of this, you kind of know that. So if I if I wanted to go into reverse, how does Sam Hill would I do that? What's that should it? be upstairs. Well, I really appreciate that. I wonder who was going to get here. And mention to the girl in the office in there that mm -hmm. Judy's uh, transmission dipstick is here and I her she will be Judy's being here. So I'll sit you in there. Judy and her. And there's a brake pad set. Is that. Uh, that's yours. Right there. They're out here. They've got it up there. Okay. All right. So there you go. Now, what, how am I going to put it in reverse? Somebody tell me how to put it in reverse. Do you know how to put it in reverse? Do you care? Push those things all the way back. Huh? Push those all the way back. Which all the way back? What? And you just push it. No, that won't work. That won't put it in reverse. In order to put it in reverse, you have to add another gear, right? I mean, if you've got an even number of gears, what's going to basically happen? Well, if you get three gears, this basically is three gears. It's one gear, two gears, three gears. Well, that's basically going to turn it back the same way. If you got one gear and two gears, you notice that one there is turning the opposite direction from this one. Well, it's because it's over here, you know, turning one of these, it's always going to turn the same direction. I'm going to move this forward like that, and now I'm in reverse. See that? Notice how this collar's got one, got a gear on the outside of it? Is that one that say reverse is the weakest gear in transmission? It's a spur gear, and that's probably why they're going to be saying that, because these helical gears are a little stronger. But hey, that's pretty beefy, so you're not going to generally tear it up just because it's in reverse. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I told that story about that guy that had a demo that was uh, a commercial, did a commercial for us at the Ford place. He went first, second, third, fourth, and back in reverse going down the road on his little Bronco, Bronco 2. Okay. Now he's back in neutral. So now everybody knows how to put it through all the gears, so you'll be ready for this part of your hands on final exam, right? No. <laughs> what? I have no idea what I'm looking at. This is well, a manual man. transmission. Well, I know that. Yeah. Well, you, <coughs> and you were, you were disingenuous with that statement. I have no idea what I'm looking at. This is where the clutch goes. This is where the drive shaft goes. Everything in between here gives you your race here. But nobody ever answered my question about if I've got three and a half to one here, and I got, let's say, three to one in the back, what's three and a half times three? Exactly. So basically, you've got a gear ratio in first gear from the drive, from the engine to the wheels of ten and a half to one. Got it? That's pretty strong, isn't it? That's how an engine with only 300 pounds of torque can move a 3,000 pound vehicle real easy. You put that engine out there without a transmission, it's not going to do very well. Okay? Now then, now it's time to fire up the projector. Is everybody comfortable with this? All right.
Does everybody know what we're looking at here? Manual yeah. transmission. Yeah. Manual transmission. Good answer. All right. All right. Now I'm going to get in here. All right. Now I'm going to go into my folder here. And I'm going to go into the fall. And I'm going to go into. Where are you going? Jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now don't piddle around and play with that while I'm doing this thing right here. Yeah. All right. Don't slam it on the table either. Annual transactional statement. Yeah. All right. Now watch this. I'm gonna go ahead and go through this from the beginning. All right. All right. You see this here? This is a manual five-speed transactional. That one over there that you see that's got the top off of it, that is a manual four-speed transactional. Now, in addition. Uh, as a part of your final in order to have a show me power flow through that one, you're going to have to show me power flow through that one, and that's what this PowerPoint presentation is about. All right. Front wheel drive 5 speed transmission and a differential. The differential is built in. The differential on that one is in the back end. Right? Uh, and what is a differential and why do we need it? Anybody know? We talked about this before. Why do you need a differential? One uh, wheel turns the different speed. Correct. You gotta have a well, let one wheel turn faster than the other when you're going to run corners. This is a differential. Axles are planned into these gears, these are carrying the extra. But this is actually one out of a front wheel drive differential. It's not very big. All right. Now then, what we have here, you obviously got the transaxle, you got the release bearing, the release fork, you got the pressure plate, the clutch disc, the flywheel assembly. The clutch is a single dry plate type. Well, we're not going to have a wet clutch in hardly any car anyway. I've got to make sure I'm going to, how much time is on my thing because I don't want to run short. All right. It's got a self-adjusting clutch release out there on that particular one. Okay, that is a very simple sideways exploded view of this. You know what I mean? I basically took my PDF and turned it into a PowerPoint. That's what I did. That's what you're seeing. It's all, that's all the pieces to it. Okay, how many pieces is in here? So let's tell me. Over I, see, I see 120. So. Yeah, yeah, they're probably pretty close. I think 120 is probably. I see 122. Yeah, you see a 122? Okay. So I didn't ever see what the highest number was. I'm just you know pecking at y'all. All right. And this is all the numbers for all of these parts. The names for all those parts. Yeah. That's basically. And you know why it's really necessary to have an exploded view of the transmission in this chart right here? So you if you need a part of that there. transmission. And you go into the parts room, you can't throw that part on the counter and say, give me one like that. You have to be able to tell the parts man, I want this particular part and tell him what it is. Now, sometimes the parts guy will pull up his illustration, he'll swing it around, and he'll point it out to you and say, tell me which part one of these parts you need. And you may find yourself looking at it and say, wait a minute, that doesn't look like what I've got in my shop manual. You've know, you got to kind of parse everything figured out. That's what's a lot of fun about these. I was telling uh, Amber yesterday, because she's working on that transmission across the way, that uh, there was a guy, and, and any time you have a transmission or a transaxle that's leaking fluid, you better fix that leak, because sooner or later you're going to forget to check the fluid, and it's going to run out, and it's going to destroy things. Mine's been empty for like a how long? What's that? Mine's been empty for a how long? Yeah. Well, anyway, the long and the short of it is that front shaft, that, that, and you're, what you're looking at, Amber, is exactly, this is easier to see than what you're working on, my work, because what you guys have read, I mean, in the case. But we had one that destroyed, because it ran out of juice, it destroyed the input shaft, the bearing, and the cluster gear. And those three parts cost $1,200. And it was a transmission, just like the one she's working over there right now. I didn't blow up. And this is a nice, simple, Shifter mechanism, right? Easy to understand, right? Nothing to that. Ain't that right, Brian? Yeah. yeah. All right. So, Brian, come and tell us how it works. No, I'm kidding. All right. So, basically, this is giving you a nice, concise little picture of here. The external shift mechanism is a floor-mounted shift lever with a knob and a nut. Pivots through the boot assembly, held by the support and stabilizer assembly. Our escort has got this arrangement. The escort that we got out here, it's got this arrangement like this. All right. Now, incidentally, I know a guy that's got a, uh, a Mercury Tracer that's in really good shape that looks it's the same vehicle as that escort, but it needs an engine, automatic transmission. And uh, I think he'd sell it for like $300. All 
But anyway, you got the detent spring now. Somebody tell me what a detent is. Whenever you hear, you see the word detent on one of these, what does detent mean? That's a place where it naturally wants to stop. You know, uh, this morning when you guys pulled the uh, um, transmission oil pan off of that 4 uh, 70 w over there, and I said, where's the rooster comb? You remember that? The rooster comb's got a bunch of detents. So that you go click, 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 click. You know, park, reverse, and drive neutral. So it'll stop in the place where you've put it. And that's where it'll stay, and it won't be floating around, changing gears on you while you're going down the road. The detent on one of these will typically have a spring with a ball, and this rail will slide through there with a little notch in it. And when the rail gets to the place where it's supposed to be, the ball will drop into that. And if you take your hand off of it, that's where it's going to stay. That's what a detent is. It's a basically something that goes click, and it stays in a place until you click it back out of there. Uh, you got a plunger, shift control, shaft boot. Now the detent spring and plunger uh, is basically going to be, and I've got to find that, number two. See number two? Or number two? Well, there it is. Right. You got a spring up there. If I zoomed in on that, you see a spring. And that little thing is not a ball, but it's round on both ends, and it, it can ride up out of that little CM3 little teeth. That's how that works. And then you got all this stuff. This is basically the shift part of it from the front part of the cage, right? All right. And this is basically a long drawn out, you know, a bunch of verbiage on that kind of thing. But you can kind of see how it's laid out in there. Okay, somebody show me the differential. J. Where's the differential? One. J. Or J. Yeah, right there. Hey, girl. Sorry to interrupt. I uh, moved her vehicle. You got it. What we'll do, just leave the key in it. What we're going to do is put the dipstick in it. We'll clear her code. Okay. Somebody else might need to move it, though. It's just fine. It's all right. It's going to be good. All right, if you brought the vehicle up here, we got the transmission testing for it anyway. So right here is where the engine is bolted, and it drives it this way. And can you see how power flow for this is a little bit different than on that one? It pretty much works the same way, but there's a shaft here, there's a shaft there, and this one right here. Uh, you know, you've got a cluster here that's driven. The cluster here is more or less driven by the engine on this one, and, it's, and but it's got one gear that shifts over here, and this is the differential that's ring gear and pinions right here, see? And we'll look at that a little bit more. Uh, and you got the rotational movement of the input shaft, see this is a lot of stuff. I did this pretty quick, but we're going to look at neutral. Power flow in neutral goes nowhere. This is running, but there's nothing being transmitted in any direction. All right. Now this is the power flow. The reason I'm going through this is I want you to understand the power flow of these manual transmissions. Here's first gear. The engine drives the input cluster gear shaft, which is like, like there could be a cluster gear right there. Because when I say cluster gear, all these gears are made together, and so they're sort of in one piece, more or less. Uh, the synchronizer hubs engage the main shaft first gear on input cluster gear shaft drives first gear on the main shaft, and the main shaft is down here. The main shaft drives the differential wing gear. Is she leaving right now, or can she give us a few minutes? What do you think? Is she leaving right now? Can you leave it up? Dustin, go put some air in her time. All right. He's my gopher. You go, boy. Go sit out there too long, either. I'll be thinking something's going on. All right, now right here, the engine drives the cluster gear. So we got first gear, excuse me, right here we got first gear. Look how it goes. See the arrows? You basically move this forward. Click. When you move that forward, it's kind of like this. It engages that, and it drives this gear, which drives the ring gear, and the ring gear drives the differential, which goes out to your CV axles. Got it? Why do we need CV axles? Why can't we just put straight shafts going out there? Because they got a flex, a turn. And what else? Pivot. Well, they got, they got to make it shorter and longer, too, as the suspension changes, right? So they have to plunge and all that. All right, second gear. Now watch this. The engine is going to be driving this input cluster gear. It's going through here. Why? Because now this is clicked back and on this main shaft gear. You've actually made that a part of the main shaft. And so you're going through here and out to the, to the actual again. This is not very complicated. It's a good thing to study. Engine drives the input cluster gear shaft, third and fourth synchronizers engaged to the third gear. All right, what has happened here? This one's moved forward. 
And so now it's engaged this gear. So now you're driving that one and this one here. You notice, Brian, how these gears get a little bigger as you go. Hey, did you have a 10-speed bicycle? Yeah. All right, it works the same way. Did you ever pay attention to how it worked, or did you just shift gears and enjoy the pedal? Well, I tended to not look behind when I was going forward. <laughs> yeah. whenever, uh, whenever I was a little kid, about five years old, I was out there at the smokehouse behind my grandmother's house. By the time I came along, even they quit using smokehouses because everybody had refrigerators. And there was a clock there, and I took that clock, and I said, can I have this clock? She said, yeah, it's a little alarm clock. I put the back off of it. And I found out I could wind it up and I could get it to the place where the alarm would go and all those gears would whirl. It just amazed me. I would just do that, you know. And then I took it home and I showed it to my dad that night. I, was, I had him right here on his pocket while he was washing his greasy hands. He came over for a shop. And I said, look what I got. And then he had his soapy hands winding my alarm clock. I was afraid he was going to mess it up. But the point is, gears always interested me. So when I saw a 10-speed bicycle, I would say, why does the gear change? Oh, this one here is moving to a bigger gear and that one's moving to a smaller gear. And I found myself working my head to understand that even then. Now, there are some people that never think about that. They just ride the bicycle and don't worry about how it works. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, I'm not saying anything bad about you, but you're going to go in. Although, I guess you could take it away if you wanted to. <laughs> Basically, oh, oh. <laughs> just kidding. the long and the short of it is, here we've got to be able to look at this stuff and think about how it works. Because if you can't get your head wrapped around these gears, you're never going to understand it. Now, going through here, this is fifth gear. Now, I didn't go, I actually messed up on fourth gear somehow. How did I miss fourth gear? Third gear is what I went. Engine in drive the poster gear. There you go. Let's move forward and we move that back. Now we've got this one. And you notice, what do you notice about these two gears right here? They're the same size. Exactly. That's right. You got it, man. And this one right here, these are not quite the same size. This one's a little bigger. This one right here, that one's even smaller and that one's a little bigger. You see where I'm going with that? As you change the size of the gears, you change the number of rotation of the power, the torque. The torque goes down, the power, I mean, the speed goes up. All right, engine drives the front cluster gear shaft, third, fourth, synchronizer, engage, fourth gear. Uh, and so man, the main shaft drives the differential ring gear, and so there, that's, you know, you've already seen that. And so this one here is in fifth gear, and uh, engine drives a cluster gear. Now, that, watch this. This has got a separate shaft, so you can have fifth gear, and you had to flip the transaxle over to see it from the top. See, if all the previous things you were looking at, this here was in a different spot. So basically, in other words, the differential was down here on the previous illustrations. So you're going all the way through here, and this gear right here, and that one, see this one here? These right here are about the same size still, aren't they? But look at what happens over here. That one gets littler. Right? All right, so there you go. You're actually driving that. Going here, one through there, and that's a sort of, see, you move that back. That's why that arrow's pointing that way. And then this one here is going to be driven faster than that one. That's the long and short of it. And then in reverse, you notice it's uh, the engine power drives a cluster gear. And basically, it's very similar to what I showed you on that other transmission. It's going to engage this that's on the outside. It's hard to see that because the gear that they're trying to show you is in a different place. You see that gear back there behind that other one? It clicks back and it engages with that gear right there, which is actually built onto the slider. It moves it between first and second. All right. Everybody clear about that? Now, here's our problem diagnosis. All right. Let me see how much time we got. Okay. Um, road test the vehicle. Who road tested a vehicle today? Did you road test one? Who else road tested one? Anybody else road test a vehicle? Verify correct fluid level. My wife was taking uh, the kids one time years and years and years ago to Mississippi, and whenever she, she was driving a little Ford Escort, had a manual transmission. And a lot of these manual transmissions or transaxles have got automatic transmission fluid for the lubrication fluid. That seems strange, doesn't it? She's heading off up there, and she got up into somewhere in Mississippi, way up in northern Mississippi, up north of Tupelo, and all of the fluid got out of the transaxle, and it burned up the transaxle. So I had to take her another car up there to drive. I had to bring it back. I had to put another transaxle in it. Uh, but anyway, it destroyed it. Huh? So I wonder why mine didn't burn up. It was being dry. Yeah. I tell you what, that one did, because you know, on a trip it is hot. Transaxle leaks have to be fixed if you've got shifting problems. Here's another little short story. Uh, the transmission on some of the little Toyota Corollas in the early 70s was really cool to work on because you had a bunch of 12 millimeter uh, head, 8 millimeter bolts, and when you open it up, you're looking at it like a suitcase. 
when you take it apart, it was just put together and like this poof, that anaerobic sealer and all. And uh, you could just see your gears all laid in that case, just beautiful. And I worked on it and replaced whatever synchronizer was messed up or whatever. And then when I put it back, the only kind of oil I had on hand was 140 weight. And you're, it was supposed to have something like 50 weight motor oil, I can't remember what it was. And uh, the gears would clash every time you'd shift because the oil was too heavy for the synchronizers to cut it off of the, you know, the gear that it was going against. And that's a bit of a problem. Erratic noises. The transessile noisy in forward gears and it's noisy in neutral. So you're actually basically going, you got a troubleshooting table that follows this. But you can pay attention to that. Something else I was telling her, if you know, one of the, if a linear transmission like the one that she's working on, like I had on the table a while ago, uh, if the bearing in the front of that one on that input shaft is messed up, it will be noisy in every gear except fourth. And when you go into fourth, it'll be really quiet. But every other gear will be noisy, and that's because that bearing right there has gone bad. That one right there, right there on the input shaft. That one, that'll be the bad one. However, it can be noisy because these gears are destroyed too if it's been run low on oil, so you have to pour. And then you got a lot of stuff you can look at right here. That's a pretty good little handout, actually. Uh, then you've got other troubleshooting table right here, you know, Warner damage components and all that. Uh, so if you've got, you got to make sure that you've got a fluid check uh, and all that when you're doing it. Always check the fluid. And you know, you've got shims, you got service shims that you're going to use get this uh, clearance is right and the preload right on the bearings. If it's got bearings like this, they need to be preloaded. If it's got bearings like the, and the one like you like you had it came apart over there, that was because it took apart so many times. Uh, but if you got these other kind of bearings like that one, you don't have to preload that bearing. But the ones that are cone shaped, you got to preload. And this gives you a bunch of silly illustrations of what they look like when they're messed up. You can look at a bearing and tell when it's bad. Stain discoloration, and it'll be caused by uh, incorrect lubricant or moisture. Right that, you know, frontage, smears, all kinds of stuff, abrasive roller wear, and that kind of thing. And that's the end of the slide chain. So, anybody learn anything there that you didn't know before? You're going to be able to show me power flow through that transaxle over there at the end. This will be on YouTube. This video will. So, if you get the notion, you might go through it again just to brush up on it.